that and and watch some departments like decoy their own dogs and they'll put people in the suit is just a bite dummy and i try to explain there's a big difference between a training decoy and somebody that's just in the suit getting bit So we are here, episode two, Dog Days podcast. We are bringing you the best trainers from around the world. We got here today, Mr. Everything, the mountain man, the dog trainer, <laughs> police officer, canine handler, Justin Rigney. What's going on, brother? How are you, man? It's been a minute. I haven't seen you in a while. It's been busy, man. This pet stuff keeps you more busy than the, than the other stuff. 100%, man. Yeah, so what you been getting into these days? I, you told me that you was like super busy. Yeah, man, we've been blessed, bro. Just buried in pet training. I've had very, very little time to do any kind of working dog stuff. And that's been a true blessing, man, but absolutely inundated, man. So we're, uh, we're trying to build a team, man. We are uh, in the process of looking for trainers because uh, the work is plentiful, man. Just a true blessing. Yeah, every dog needs to be trained. I see that you, you're in like super shape now, bro. Like I was like, dang, he's. He's getting bigger, more lean looking. I don't know <laughs> if it's your diet or what, man, but he, I see you in super shape. What you been doing for, with that? Well, you know, I tried. I, I've been in the gym since I was like 13, 14 years old, man. Never left. So if you knew how much time I put in it, man, you'd think I'd be Ronnie Coleman by now. But I'm <laughs> just chasing him, man. But uh, no, you know, I tweak my diet. I'm trying to in the gym, you know, six days a week. And I try to stay healthy. I think a lot of it for me has been I work night shift my entire career. I was 17 years as a cop and, you know, working nights, I loved it, but it does, you know, twist up your circadian rhythm and, and your biology. and You're just not supposed to be up at night, you know? So, you know, being retired for three years now, I think things have balanced out and I'm, I'm living a healthier lifestyle for sure, man. Getting better sleep. So. Yeah, man. I, I used to work out, go to the gym two, three, four times a day, all, just always in the gym. And then I got married after I got out the army, that kind of slows down your, it's yeah. not the same. Like you don't have that same like push, but yeah. uh, my daughter runs track. So that gave me like a new like motivation. Cause I'm always pushing her. And then I got yeah. out there and ran with her and I was like, yeah, dang, I should maybe <laughs> lay off a little bit. This is a hard workout. <laughs> when you, when you get winded walking up the bleachers to go watch her, man, you know, it's time to get back out there. <laughs> right. Get back in there. I've been doing, uh, uh, I've been doing jujitsu a lot. So that's I've been, awesome, man. I usually I'm I'm probably in the gym three times a week maybe yeah great, three man. three times a week and that that's keeping me because my knees are, are horrible yeah but, but that's that's keeping me in pretty decent shape to <laughs> keep rolling I see you like MMA too you ever did uh any kind of MMA or jujitsu very man? little man very little I had um you know I've trained a little bit man but I I got into it late I became a cop when I was 28 so mm -hmm. I got you know just basic training there that was minimal. But back in that day, you know, we're going back 20 years now, you know, the ground fighting stuff was just coming into law enforcement then. And uh, it's picked up quite a bit, man. So I've, I've been fortunate to have, you know, some friends and train some dogs for some MMA fighters, some UFC guys that I've just been fans of the game for, man. But it's something I, I missed that boat. You know, I got tons of injuries, neck, back, shoulders, knees, you know, name it. I can't roll, man, for shit. So <laughs> I, you're, I, uh, you're, uh, so you're into the sport, into the I'm, I'm a fan. MMA. Okay, I'm a fan, cool, man, cool, but cool. That, that's about it, you know. But much yeah. respect for the training. Wish I could do it, man. Yeah, I seen you on a thing with uh Tiago Alves after his uh bare knuckle um fight. Yeah, man, what a brutal game, bro. Holy shit, that's brutal. Yeah, I wanted to fight, man, for a long time. I wanted to fight when like in my early 20s. Yeah, and I had a couple of friends that that they fought professionally and they have the thing called AFC or AFL here in Atlanta. And they wasn't, they weren't making any money. Like they'll go to a fight and make like 3,500 and that's it. And I was like, man, mm. all the training that you put in, like I could, you could just go to work. That, that's big money, man. You know, I've been watching lately is this on, uh, I think it's A&E has been doing documentaries on pro wrestlers, right? Mm -hmm. So I was, 
That was always my thing when I was a kid, man. I want to be a WWE wrestler, man. Because I, I grew up in Connecticut, and the WWE headquarters is right there, man, where I grew up. So, But, you know, those dudes would travel for days, man, to go wrestle for 50 bucks a night, bro. You know, crazy lifestyles. So I never knew any of that. Because, you know, you just watch the WWE, Madison Square Garden, you think it's just all right. big time, man. But, man, those guys put in their, their hours and their blood and their sweat. So much respect for that, too, man. Yeah, that's why I like D. That's why I like decoy, bro. Because I could never make it as a wrestler, but as a decoy, <laughs> I could put on the WWE theatrics, man. Yeah, you feel dogs, like so. you feel like you're doing something, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, uh, I'm a big fan of what's the the newer guy, uh, O'Malley. You, you oh, yeah. watch him at all? You know, I haven't. The, the new generation, I don't know much about, man. I I probably stopped watching it. You know. 10 years ago or so, man, but just this new documentary series came out and I've been intri intrigued because it's all the old school wrestlers that I grew up watching. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it just keeps me like, thank you. I'm not, I don't really regret not fighting at all. I yeah. still got all my brain cells. I got kids. Yes. Like, I'm yeah. not too, too broke up, but my, one of my goals is just to do, to compete, you know, get to the highest level of jujitsu that I can and just, you know, see how far that takes me. I mean, that's life skills too, man. Not only is it incredible training, but it's preparing you. Yeah. So one thing I want to ask is how how did you get started into into dog training? Like before, did it start before the law enforcement or that something that came after? Yeah, I, my story is a little bit backwards from most cops that get into canine is that I started on dogs first. And actually way back, my first love was horses as a kid. You know, I compete a little bit in, you know, the 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 jumping competitions and different I think it's called eventing now. Uh, I stopped, stopped riding horses probably when I was about 12 years old, but you know, from a very young age, I was on horses and that, that taught me a lot about connecting with animals and communication and gestural communication and, and you know, establishing that kind of a connection with, a, with an animal. It was very intriguing to me back then as a kid, just fascinated with animals, man. I, I grew up in mad dysfunction and violence, alcoholism, craziness, man. So people for me as a kid were dangerous. So I always gravitated towards animals, man. That was always my safety net. So stayed with me through high school. And um, when I was in college, I had my roommate um, who had a couple of Rottweilers, man. He did tricks with them. So I was like blown away. Like that was my initial, you know, um, kind of first interaction with dog training, man. And I was like, man, that's wild. So I was about 18, 19 at the time. And then, you know, had a little baseball career, played a little pro ball. And then as soon as I got out, man, I started actively looking to get into dogs. And I was working in construction during the day and, and going to school at night. And when I was working during the day, I would see a, a guy who was named Chris Byrne, very good friend of mine today, man. He was my first real formal introduction into professional dog training. I'd go to these delis, man, back in Connecticut where I'm from, and I'd see his business card posted up on the wall. I'm like, man, it, it was called canine. It was called uh, Dogs Unlimited. So my business now is called Canine Services Unlimited. So a little bit of, you know, thank you, a little bit of respect back to that, that business name. And uh, so I looked up Chris, hit him up immediately. He opened his door like he had known me his whole life, man. He, he treated him like family from day one. He opened his, his, his mind, his business, his family, and treated me like one of his own and taught me everything he knew about dogs. Introduced me to some amazing dog people, some really top um, so shoots and competitors, I, I, IGP, whatever they're calling it these days some top, top competitors in the New England region that were doing big things back then and had some powerful, incredible dogs, man. So my inauguration into dog training was some, some monsters, man, some monsters. So that, the club we used to train at also shared the field with a police uh, canine training organization called the Connecticut Work Police Working Dog Association, uh, which is still going strong today. Um, so when I was, you know, decoying for IPO, they say, hey, throw the suit on. I started catching police dogs and I was hooked, man. I would I'd listen to the war stories about the pursuits, the bailouts, the dog bites. I'm like, man, I'm hooked. So it was a pretty interesting story because back in Connecticut, we're talking in the late 90s. Um, we'd have two or 300 applicants going for one police job. You know, it would be these massive, you know, tests that they give and they're looking for one or two people to fill a spot. And I, I didn't get hired in Connecticut, which was a blessing because I ended up going to Florida not too, too long after. I had a good opportunity to go down there and train. And it was the opposite in Florida. They couldn't find enough qualified people, man. So I got hired quickly, got into canine quickly, and I was able to, uh, to apply the things I learned as a civilian dog trainer in, into the law enforcement, which I'm extremely grateful for. Cool, cool. Do you feel like they, uh, do they, they hire a lot of inexperienced people like people who don't have nothing to do with dogs initially like 
to fill that spot. Like some of the people, when they get in a position like that, that's their first time dealing with working dogs. I, th- I would think, yeah. So the majority of folks that are cops, guys, gals, they get into law enforcement and they see what canine does, like what the responsibility is. They're out, they're out in front. You know, but I remember back when I first got hired, my mom's like, oh, you'll be safe with a dog. And I'm like, nah, <laughs> like you're out there. You got a flashlight in one hand and you've got a leash in the other. And you're trusting that dog in front of you. And you're really the most vulnerable in canine. You're out in front. You're leading the pack, man. So, um, but what you do find is that folks see that because, of, you know, if you're into that, if you're all about hunting and, and working a dog and, you know, of course, the, it's a pay increase. They usually get, you know, the badass cars and have cool schedules and get to do a bunch of different other things. So you, you, the people are attracted to that in law enforcement to get into that position, which is very difficult because nobody really leaves unless they get booted out, you know? So a lot of people want to get in that spot and, and stay there, man. But what I'm, what I'm seeing now, and I, I don't miss the, the job at all, man. It was the best job in the world, and now it's the worst. And what you're seeing now is that they're lowering the standards because they can't keep people. It's it's a it's a dangerous dangerous time right now. So you think there's the standard of the you talking about the handler or the dog? I I just mean as in law enforcement as a whole. Okay, okay, yeah. And then, yeah, it's just a know, bad it's a bad time to to you know with yeah. the climate and everything how it's going on with police officers and the public and stuff like that. Yeah. But aside from that, man, I think that uh, as far as lowering standards, I do think that they some departments they lower it for the dog like they don't have some of those dogs are not worth no. working you know what i'm saying and oh, i don't know how they how they come across the like it's not like it's like they don't have a checklist to say this dog does this 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 and this and the, so we'll give them a chance um and i've seen some horrible you know horrible dogs on the street yep yep some dogs that shouldn't even be on couches <laughs> right that, that alone that alone the back of patrol dogs well you know my problem is a lot with the vendors they know better you know, a lot of times these these agencies don't know. They don't know what they don't know. And they're going into these purchases and these tests blind. So they, uh, sorry, man, my phone keeps clearing things. But so the, the vendors sell these dogs that they, they know they shouldn't be on the street. And my problem a lot is with that. It, it's, it's, it's got many different folds, man, because there's really a today in this era of information with technology, with social media, there's no excuse to not be educated or at least to understand that there's other things out there that can enhance your abilities to, to train the dog or also enhance the dog's abilities to perform. So there's really no excuse, man, but I, my hard part is, is with some of the vendors, man, is that they're putting things out there that are, are dangerous because the dogs are just not genetically capable of doing the job. Yeah, I've sold, I sold a handful of dogs to um, departments and I think that, and the ones that didn't get dogs from me, they, they're more concerned about like stuff that don't matter like paperwork brn numbers you know pedigrees instead of just doing some health testing hips elbows heart you know and then workability so why do you I mean, why do you think that is well because they just don't know they, they have they know buzzwords to ask if you ask them what does brn mean they're going to be like blah, 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 no clue <laughs> you know, right. they don't know what it, <clears throat> so I, I put a post up maybe a year or two years ago about if, if you're on a buying trip, right, and I brought handlers with me to go test dogs, and they ask the vendor, is he good with kids? I, I fucking snap, like, right away, you know, because they have a complete, totally different perspective on what, the, the, what we're really there for, right. you know? So when, they, when I ask questions like that, is he good with kids, before we even tested the dog, before we even see the dog's ability, like, they're, they're looking at, so is it going to blend with their life? Because they're lazy. They want the dog to be a pet and not have to deal with it in a kennel and breaking it several times a day and managing it. They want it just to be a pet, lounge around the house and throw it in a car when it's time to go to work, man. And it's a, it's a, a crazy mindset. Crazy yeah, mindset. Yeah. And then and I also have a little bit, it's like they, a lot of them work their own dogs without the knowledge of working the dogs. You know what I'm saying? Like, like you get in the front of the dog, like I've seen, I've just caught their own dogs and they'll put people in the suit is just a bite dummy. And I try to explain there's a big difference between a training decoy and somebody that's just in the suit getting bit. Like there's a huge, right. a huge difference. There's a skill level to it. And I don't think people just from the outside looking in, they're just like, that dog's just biting them. But the reaction right. we're given, how we're moving, how we're catching them, it's a, 
it's a science behind it. You know, it's a skill. And I don't think that a lot of people don't get that. Here's what's happening, like the evolution. Like you go back 20 years ago, the dogs were different. The dogs were savages. You could go to Holland, you could pick up a two and a half, three year old dog off a camp if you field, you know, shitty scores. But there's an absolute mutant. You can bring it back to America, put it into your shitty ground and pound training program, electrify the thing to get it through your, your state certification. And there's tons of horsepower, tons of gas left to go hunt and eat on the street if it, the dog didn't kill you in the process. Right, right. Those, dogs, those dogs are gone. But the training mindset <laughs> is still there. So what's happened since 9-11, the global demand on dogs has gone through the roof. Like you cannot find enough good dogs. A lot of different breeders, a lot of different vendors got into the game for quick money and it's watered down the genetics. And it used to be, you couldn't get your hands on a dog for police work yet less than two years old. You just couldn't do it. Now they're telling you the dogs are a year old and you're looking at the dog, you're like, man, that fucker's like nine or 10 months old. Like there's no way. So what's happening is the genes are good. Like the dogs are solid, but they need a lot more building and a lot more development, which time is money. And these agencies, A, don't have the skill set. They don't have the time and they, they push these dogs through these programs and they, they break them. So I, I would, I'm not a dog vendor and I, I don't know how they survive, but this whole performance guarantee that these agencies are allowed to have is, is bizarre to me. Like I would never give it, there's a, there's probably a handful of police dog trainers out there that I would give a dog to with a performance guarantee. because I know they're going to do everything in their ability to make the dog succeed and they have the skill set and the experience to make it happen. But a lot of folks don't, a lot of them are faking it. They still have that, that 20 plus a year ago ground and pound training mentality where they're breaking these young dogs. They're, there's a year performance guarantee, day 364.5, they're bringing the dog back, back broke to the vendor and expecting you to replace it. Yeah. And it's the dogs, the dogs fuck. It's, there's no coming back from the damage they've done. So, but what's, what you're seeing the evolution is a lot of the newer generation who is paying attention to these podcasts, who's watching content on social media, trying to educate themselves and implement it into their programs. You're seeing it more and more and more. And the organization I'm a part of, Canines United, has done a tremendous job as far as putting out free training. We're, we're doing three, four, five seminars a year that are completely free with some incredible talented decoys, man. And trainers like Carlos Ramirez or Michael Nesbitt, Jay Nix, Michael Gooseby. Some incredible talent, man, all over this country that has been there and done that. And they're giving the training for free. So people are evolving. They're seeing the light. And it's, you have to develop these dogs. Like I talk a lot of shit about my agency and the shit I went through with them. But the one thing they didn't really break my chops was, was about time. They understood that these dogs needed more time. You know, So I, my typical patrol dog school with detection, tracking, patrol, everything together was about six months. Six months, man. Where, where you're at, there's agencies out there that are cranking <laughs> Six four weeks. to six weeks. Yes. Yeah, right. It's crazy, bro. Crazy, crazy. My, my agenda was always to, you know, once I got the dog in the program, continue to evaluate it, continue to test it and evaluate and see where its nerve threshold is, make sure the aggression is in there, that I can unlock it and I can tap into when necessary. Get the dogs to a level where I'm satisfied. Okay, this is a prospect that's going to make it. And then I would always dumb down the bite work to make it just, you know, more distraction and obedience so I can get them certified in my school. So once they're certified, they can go hunt. So my plan was to, while we're training, we're still developing the dogs, they're certified and they can go hunt on the street to get them bloody in front of me. So I know that when they leave my school, that I can rest assured, like I can sleep at night knowing the dog's going to perform. He's going to engage on the street. So that was always the benefit that I had down there was making sure I had, I had the time. Yeah. What is, uh, what's your take on the, uh... You know how there's these dogs. It's not that the dog's bad. Like some videos I see of dogs going out chasing people and not engaging. I don't think all of those dogs are horrible. I think that some of them just it's a training error. You know. Mm-hmm. So like I went to a couple of departments and I I've worked dogs and they wouldn't bite me without the suit on, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think that a lot of people try to bring their sport background into uh into the real world work dog you know uh, law enforcement work and not change the application you got what i'm saying right sure so they keep the same application for everything across the board and you can kind of see i think it's just a tendency because if if i started off working personal protection dogs and i wasn't involved in sport so i can like now that i'm trying to do psa i 
I see myself going, still going back to that. Like when my dog is around people and he's doing stuff that I'm like, oh, it really doesn't matter if I'm doing the sport, but it kind of, it still bothers me. So I can see people doing that the other way around. You got what I'm saying? Right. Yep. hundred percent. And so, uh, to, to alleviate that problem, like of giving the dog a suit or sleeve, like we always, you see how Charlie Randolph does, like he's covering mm -hmm. it up or he's, putting it on like I never like giving my dog the, a sleeve like a unless I'm like building his bite or something you know like a like an IGP sleeve or just a hard sleeve with the you know I always give him a something that's going to transition to what he's doing in the future and that way right. I don't have to worry about like weaning it off you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. for sure man it, it, it's picture training so it, it is the one thing that you train for that you can never, ever, ever recreate, no matter what, man. Some, some dogs that I, I have one dog in particular, I remember that was a monster in training, bro, an absolute savage. I mean, this dog was an all-star. We ended up washing him out, man. He had six opportunities to bite. He was a dog that I didn't have, I didn't do the foundation. I had to do the cleanup work to get him certified because he's mm -hmm. a little, he was a very, very strong dog in, in the training. When it came time for the, to bloody somebody on the street, man, the dog wouldn't do it. So, it, you know, you can never recreate the chemical signals in training. I don't give a shit how many burpees you do. You can PT, you can jump around, get your cardio up, your heart rate, your pulse, all those things. You cannot recreate the chemical dump that a handler feels, a bad guy feels, the dog experiences in the real world. And those equipment cues aren't present. So the work you guys do is incredible. I, I'm huge fans of what you guys do. I had a chance to train with you guys a couple of years ago. And it, it's the pictures that you're, you're showing the dogs are as close to reality as you can get. I do like muzzles. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of the muzzle. I, I think it becomes another cue, another tool. There's a lot of work you can do to desensitize a dog to the muzzle. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times it can suppress the dog and change, change its outlook. So for me, I like the, the prosthetic, the rubber prosthetic limbs. I think that's as close as we can yeah, get. Yeah, we use that a lot. Yeah, it's a great tool, man. And it, it, of course, it's got its own odor signature. It's got its own texture. But in the first few times, man, it's as close as you can get. And I saw some videos not too long ago of, of dudes slipping the prosthetic arm. Man. Like, what, what are you doing? Like, so for me, yeah. like, it should just make it a toy. You know, yeah, you right. make it something the dog can possess, man. So for me, with the prosthetics, it's a quick, it's not this long bite session of ground and pound and pushing. It is a quick jab. It's he experiences that there's chaos and he's taken off quickly. And there's a pursuit where the decoy gets up and runs and he's gone, bro. So he has that little bit of taste, that little bit of fight. And he's taken off frustrated and wants more and more and more. And I also have a program that or, or system that I use called Boogeyman. Mm -hmm. It's a little, it's pretty long winded, man. It kind of it takes a while to kind of explain it. But for me, it's the secret sauce, man. It, it is the missing link in all aggression training, whether it's sport, protection, police. It takes two seconds. There's no equipment and it taps into the dog's soul 100%. It, it makes them men <laughs> or, right. you know, strong, strong dogs, 100%. Man. 100%. So I think I know what you're talking about. Can you, you explain it a little bit? Yep. So Boogeyman is a, is a system where you take the dog out of a training environment. You take all equipment cues off. I don't want any other dogs and cars barking around the dog. I want the handler to go for a ride. And, and it's a predetermined spot where the handler takes the dog out of the car, just on a choker and a leash and goes for a piss break. You know, they take no harnesses, no flat collars, nothing that says it's time to work. So the dog gets out of the car the handler doesn't tell him to do shit. He just goes for a walk and it's better done in low light. So the dog can't see very well. And I always make sure the wind is up the dog's ass if possible, because I don't want to make it a scent work, uh, any scent associations in the beginning. Right. It's all a vis visual cue. So the dog comes out to a certain spot and the, the decoy is way down range, probably 30, 40 yards. And he's, I, I lay low. I get behind, I like go underneath the tarp. You know, behind a dumpster, I'll wear some dumb shit like a ghillie suit, a Halloween mask to make it a little bit weird, to change the picture for the dog that he's like, what is that shit? And some dogs you think are super strong. Yes, I, I've work seen them break a lot. Bro, you take them. And this is way more delicate work than any type of aggression you're doing in the suit, sleeves, muzzles. Like this is because the dog is teeter tottering on their genetics. Trust me when you see it. So the dog comes out to that predetermined spot. I'm way down range, 30, 40 yards away. I'm low, laying prone, covered, ghillie suit, tarp, whatever it is. And then when the dog comes out the end of the leash, I have the handler actually blade away from where I'm at. So there's no 
no cueing of the dog for anything. The handler's just going to sleep. So once the dog is standing there, like, what the fuck are we doing? And usually I try to put them on pavement so there's no grass or other things to fuck around with. Mm-hmm. And then once the dog's standing there looking around, like, what the fuck? I'll do something to get the dog's attention. Like, I like a maybe an empty water, plastic water bottle, just crinkle it. So you crinkle it and they look down mm-hmm. range, like, yo, what was that? And once there's a visual connection made with me downrange, then I start creeping and crawling. Little by little, I'll lift up, boom. And what I'm looking for in the dog is to give me some type of forward aggression. Right. Some t- so I'm looking for audible barking for sure, but sometimes the dogs are mutes and they just lean into the collar. And sometimes that's enough. And what I'm simply looking for is a dog to say, shit, there's something in my environment that's gonna fuck me up because it's a very weird picture for the dog. And, and dogs of all thresholds, sometimes they'll activate immediately. And sometimes you have to get closer and closer to the dog. So depending on the dog's threshold is reaction, it's completely based off me. But when I get the reaction I'm looking for, again, if it's a low growl, it's leaning into the collar, yeah, yeah. or if it's active aggression, I take off running, boom. Right. And I'll, I'll have a whip in my hand. I'm not a big whip for reactive training, mm-hmm. but what I'll will, as I'm running away, I will crack the whip and then the handler allows a pursuit. I get out of sight. And I'm gone. This is a short pursuit. There's no bite or anything. And at that point in time, the handler takes the dog to where I was laying. And then it becomes a little bit of a scent connection. So they say, okay, there's human odor there. I smell it in the wind a little bit. But really, it's a visual cue. And people say, yo, where's the reward? Like, where's the bite? The reward is flushing the prey. The reward is it's a real world conflict where the animal must react on its environment or the environment is going to fuck you up. Because it's, it's real shit. There's no suits, no sleeves, nothing saying to the dog, this is training. And let's say you get a dog with a little bit higher threshold that doesn't react right away. Right. Then I start, you know, on 45 degree angles, I start slicing the pie a little bit closer and closer until I get into that zone where then I'm credible. Like then I'm relevant. He's got to do something. Usually you see them respond. And again, take, as soon as I see that, that activation, I take off running. Right. So a little sidebar thing I use to help people do this is that sometimes you're so far down range or there's background noise that you can't hear that low growl or you can't see the cue because you're wearing that stupid mask or that shit falls yeah. down in your face so what i do the decoy is holding the e-collar not with the contact points in your skin so you know you don't trust your buddies yeah. is that <laughs> you hold the e-collar and it's set to vibrate so the handler's got the remote when the handler sees the target behavior they hit the vibrate which is the cue for the decoy Make you to, to get, get out, out of there this way you don't say go and the dog turns around and looks at you like what'd you say so there's a silent communication process so the decoy knows when to run right yeah so we don't want y'all uh, people at home going do this to your dog and you can't read a dog messing up your dog <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of people already know they're gonna they're gonna hear this and they're gonna go and be like oh i'm trying this and then getting the wrong reactions out of dog because if you know like a lot of people read dogs wrong you know yes and so they think they see something, but they don't see it. You know, there's a couple of people who come to our club. The dog's been working for a while. And then, you know, Marcus, right? Mm. Marcus Alexander, tall. Yes, kid. yes, yes. So, yes. so, you know, Marcus, he's not all there sometimes. So if a dog's showing and he can see that the dog is like showing the aggr- forward aggression, but he's like, he's not, he doesn't want to bite me for real. Yep. He'll just go in and pet him. I'm talking about mid, like, <laughs> and just yep. going like, he doesn't want to bite just to show the handler that, this is not, you know, you have to, I, I see stuff that you don't, you know? And yes. so everybody doesn't really realize that. Like I see a lot of defensive stuff and they post that and like, it's cool, like lip curling. And I'm like, bro, that dog is not, that's not, that's not what you think it is. You got what I'm saying? Right. So yep. you, you see a dog with, as soon as I see a dog curl his lips or start that long, he's singing to me. Mm-hmm. That's not, the aggression that you're looking for you know what i'm saying no, no. and so reading the dog is probably the most important part to decoying training handling you know knowing yes. when to give and when to go and stuff like that and, and what your group is excellent at is knowing how to press the dogs how far you can go it's testing it's pressing but it's also empowering because a lot of times what i see is like the you know, I have, I use a lot of negative punishment and bite, bite development is putting the dog up when they fuck up. And that's a strong tactic is that everybody believes the dog has to win, 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 win every time out. 
And, you know, of course, that's the dog training one-on-one theory, but nothing makes a dog stronger like losing sometimes. But what I see in the videos that you guys post and, and the stuff that the work that you do that I've seen is that you guys are very, very skilled at knowing that edge, how far to push and when to give. And that, that's the science behind it. And that does not come with reading books. That does not come with watching right. podcasts. You, feel you can't teach that. You can't teach it. You have to feel it's got to be in you and you have to experience it and you have to know. And there's going to be times where you've gone too far and you fucking make a mental note. You're like, shit, that that particular dog is too far, but the next one it's perfect for. So that's the problem that I see, especially in law enforcement as a whole. Cops are type A mechanical, black and white. It's got to be this, this, this. It could, yeah. Yes. And, and dog training is fluid. It's dynamic. It's feel. It's touch. It's connection with a creature. It's not easy, man. It's not easy. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a lot of improvision too. Like, like sometimes dogs don't give you exactly what what you're looking for. You know, like right. even if the dog's strong, like sometimes, like I talked about with Calvin last time, with the with the luring, some dogs don't like to just go straight into your hand. They like a little bit weary about it. Some dogs have phenomenal bites, but one thing I hate is to see a dog uh, like you put them on a table or in a little in a box. And they, they go to the end of the line and then they lean back and you can see that they're slacking the line. Like mm -hmm. if I unhooked him, he wouldn't even know he was unhooked. He's just standing right. there. So then he's waiting for you to give him a bite. So then I tell mm -hmm. people all the time, listen, you, you created that. You, you was so worried about giving them bites and putting them up, you know, with a bite, like give him win, let him win. So he knows it's coming. I'm just going to chill here. And yep. then you, walk him down with a bite, even though he's not showing you the behavior, what, what he needs to do to get a bite. You got what I'm saying? A hundred percent, man. And, and why I'm so grateful for my early foundation training, because it was Schutzen based. And you're talking about, you know, 30 years ago, man, where the dogs were different, but there's a, a guy that a lot of folks don't know about or hear about today, a guy named Helmut Reiser, mm -hmm. who is, who is the godfather of aggression of building active aggression. So everything around the, the Holden Bark and IPO is based on active aggression with deep, powerful, convincing barking that's got strong cadence, it's got rhythm, it's got strong pitch and tone where it clearly shows the dog's drive and his intentions. That, that's where I see it's lost. Like people reward prey barking so much. Well, pre barking and prey is a highly unnatural state for a dog. Uh, you would never see a wolf in Yellowstone stalking an elk and start barking at that fucker and say, hey, bah, 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 run, let's make this fun. Fuck no, he's going to stalk him and pursue him silently. Barking in prey is so unnatural for a dog. And that's why you see this wishy-washy mindset or the, the drive state of the dog is fucked up because they're barking, rah, 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 high pitched. It's like this roller coaster barking. Mm -hmm. And then when that's marked and paid, the dog stays in that conflicted mindset. Right. So I see, I see that all the time. If, if people not understanding drive channeling, not understanding clearly what gear the dog is in. And like you just said, they, they mark that, they pay that, and the dog stays in that perpetual state. It's hard to undo that. Yeah, man. It's, the hard, first... it's, it's hard to do that in any phase. Like I'm dealing with a dog, I'm training a dog, retraining a dog in arson detection right now. Mm -hmm who has been shown, like given help every step of the way. She barks con constantly, she barks. And if I go to make the barking stop, it suppresses her, man. So early foundation training is so crucial. Early imprinting is so crucial in any phase of training that we do. Yeah, man, I, had a, I have a dog that I just recently sold. And this dog is, as far as his bite work is concerned, he is phenomenal. But he can handle a lot of pressure from the decoy. But handler, he's super handler since it's like correcting him with the leash, prong. You know, I, I just had to put a slip lead on him, you know, to get some of the behaviors that I want. But it, it, I'm talking about completely like, I'm not saying he, he sheds down so he wouldn't want to bite, but I see a big change in his behavior where he's like, he starts moping, you know. Yes. And that's the biggest, biggest difference in dogs today is if you go back to yesteryear, like I was talking about 20 years ago, savages and, and us meatheaded cops, bro. Like if the dog didn't come up the leash a few times, you didn't want him. Like, cause the theory was stupid. Like if that, he's gonna that's how leash, I am right now. <laughs> <laughs> but dogs like that, man, are, are why I'm in love with Nipopo because one of the great Nipopo has got many, many dimensions, man. You're talking about a, a, an application or a school that's five days, nine to five, 
hundred question tests, like mind blowing shit. And you're still confused at the end of day five. Right. But one of the greatest as- attributes of, of Nipo Po is the preparation of the dogs. Preparation for the day that they receive higher level corrections from the handler. And also the preparation for pressure they can see from outside sources like the decoy of the environment. It, it, that's one of the greatest aspects of the system to me, man, that I love is preparing dogs for the day that they get corrected. And they don't shut, not only does it, they want the correction to shut them down, the correction jacks them up and drives them into the target behavior. So for me, that's a huge aspect of it, man. Yeah, I think, I think, um, I came across Nipo Pope maybe a few years before I went to the HITS conference and listened to you uh, do the, the, the seminar or the teaching on it and uh you know i was very just interested and intrigued about how the system goes and in some aspects you're kind of doing it already if you you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. like you're doing yep. some pieces of it uh, um but just tapping into a dog knowing like a lot of people use the e-collar in the worst in the wrong way and i was doing that at first when i first got into e collar it was just the correction like it was just like the dog's barking, shut up, um, yep. that's it, you know, and then mm-hmm. totally wrong. So now it's like, you know, teaching the place, teaching the force retrieve, teaching almost everything. You you know, I, I'm going to do it with a continual stem, do what I want, you know, and uh, it's just been working out good for me. And, and you, when you start off dogs early with that, I feel like they they go up and drive, like the dog Reaper mm-hmm. that I got from um, from the UK. If he, when he feels the stem, I'm like, sit, he's like, <gasps> I gotta, yes. you know, get him to kind of chill out because he knows the e is working down, you know. Yep. hundred percent, man. I, I've had a lot of conversations, man, sidebar conversations with Bart about this. And I asked him one time, I said, cause I've seen it, man. You see dogs like what you're explaining. I've seen it in little pet dogs that are mixed breeds, but like you, you tap the collar and they get invigorated. Like it's, they're excited. It just happens by accident. I asked Bart, I said, are the Belgians producing dogs that naturally get jacked up on their electronics? He said, it's not intentional. He thinks it's evolution of the breeding. The systems that they use and the dogs evolve in the systems and then that carries over genetically. That's not my dimension, man. That's not my, my side of the house. I can't speak on genetics, but man, I almost think that I swear that they're producing what they are. Like you see these dogs just get tapped on a low level, man, and they're, poof, they're hot. You know, mm-hmm. but we can we can produce that. We can manufacture that if they don't have that genetically. Man. Like, yeah, I the, think like that's a learned behavior. Like I think yeah, it's just yeah. a it's something that they pick up on and they know. Okay, this stem. If I don't go up, you know, if they've been rewarded for it, you got what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. It's cr- like in some elements, like some dogs. Uh, I've seen people even do the barking hole. If he stops barking, they correct. You know, I've seen people correct them or stem them for that, and then. Yep. Soon as he starts again, he let it off, and he's and he's giving yep. a more stronger bark. So um, I've been, I've seen some dogs that you sh- you sh- like while he's on the bite. If they try to shock him off the bite, he's just going. It just makes him way worse. So I well, think here, it's, here, it's something learned. Here's 100, percent and here's why for that. You know, and I got a video coming out too. That I'm going to post to explain this in depth, but. Some e-collar manufacturers, their e-collar delivers a contracting stimulation. Like if you ever had a tins pad on, you know, you go to the chiropractor. Yes, you can't control pads. it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, if you, you have it, up. yep. If you have a system, or have an e-collar system that delivers a contracting stimulation, and and you put the system like if this is a dog's mouth and this is his neck, and you put the contracting device under here, right? Right. So. And 100% of the time, tactile communication overrides verbal. So what the dog is, what you're doing or what the dog's feeling overrides what you're saying. So if I have a contracting device here, which I stimulate the dog to out, what it's going to do is contract all these muscles and close it. Right. Yeah. He can't open his mouth and you're making him bite, bite better. (laughs) So if you took the device and you put it on top of the neck, it's, it's activating these open muscles more, you have a greater likelihood of the dog out right. like i said i got a video coming out with this in greater in depth and my buddy in florida garrett wing did an experiment on himself that i'm gonna i'm gonna post that too but i see that all the time so then the dogs get stronger on their electronics they bite better on it. the same thing with the recall the the animal welf- welfare laws have these collars you can't hold the continuous down for 100 years like it's at eight to ten seconds and it automatically resets 
But if a dog is going downfield and you try to smoke it to recall and it rides that wave and it finally gets to the material, there's that blip of a second where it shuts off. Even if you put it back on for a sec, there's that moment in time where the dog says, I've gotten my teeth in the material and the pressure has stopped. Then they learn to get down there faster and faster. Yeah, man, I started, I started because of just that. I started back tying my dogs because so he just can't get to the man at all when when yep. teaching him the recall because once yep. he gets it, it's kind of over with. You just it's a lost cause. Then you he's messing up like, you know, if you're teaching it out and guard or yep. you know to come back, it's messing all that up. He's biting, he's going around, getting legs and back, and it just becomes a a big <laughs> cluster. You know what I'm saying? So you I know just, what we use man. We use a we call the shark tank. It's mm-hmm. actually a kennel. On our field, it's like a four foot by four foot kennel, you know, four feet wide, and it's six feet tall, but it's got the straight bars, like the straight European bars. It's got a gap, you know, a few inches. So what happens is we put the decoy in the cage mm-hmm. and the dog can't get to them. So, but they still, the dog has the idea that they can. And you can actually let the dog bite you through the kennel when you want to. Like you can just put your arm up to the suit or to the, the cage mm-hmm. because the bars are straight. It can get their mouth through and you can work it. But the dog still has a hope that it can get downfield and get to you, but it can't. Because once the decoy backs away from the cage, he's in the middle, the dog can't get to him. Right. It allows you to stay on lower levels of electronics. You can just nag him to come back, come back, come back, instead of having to go super aversive. Now he's got his, his mouth in the suit, and then you're, you're, it becomes a complete cluster, man. So what that does, it allows you to stay on lower levels and really teach the exercise while the dog's in a pretty high state of drive. And of course, the decoy can always open the kennel door and let them come in and bite. So that's something we've implemented years ago, and it's been very successful as far as teaching the recall, not having to, and you know, this way you don't lose ignition, you don't lose drive going downfield, because then you start to see the dogs hesitate. Right. You start going super high when they're going down in pursuit. Yeah, you so. got to tell them two, three times to go, you know, and I, I feel like I've always had to work that out. Like, you tell them to bite, they take like three strides, and they're like, Okay, I could go. Are you and sure? Then, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and then they they like, yeah, he was he really wants me to go this time, um, mm-hmm. but over time, I don't feel like I ever had a problem with it. But since we're like being like super clear and have this uh, training has evolved so much, do you feel or do you ever revert back to like some of the, your old ways? Mm-hmm. There's a time and a place, man, for the old school. Hundred percent. We've all evolve what we try to evolve as modern trainers but there's a time and a place for the old school like there's dogs that you see every now and then that are like the old school dogs and Mm -hmm. and and there's a pressure can be a magical magical thing for a dog if it's done applied fairly and the timing's good so yes no i'm a four quadrant player and and i will use tools and i will use techniques from yesteryear to make sense to a dog 100 100 percent. and when you work in an environment where dogs are hunting and biting human beings for a living they become real savages. They, they operate on a much different level than like your hardest sport dog that you've, anybody's come across that, that won't out on the suit. You can't get in the recall. It's not even scratching the surface of a dog who's hunted and, and, and apprehended humans for a long period of time. It changes the animal. They become just abs- a whole nother dimension. So my protocol always was we got a street bite, take the bag out of the hospital. We do the paperwork. And we're back at the office, the dog's on the table, and we're doing outs immediately because they will short circuit. You know, my last, my dog now is, he's eight years old. And uh, when I got booted out of canine, he was only on the road a couple of years. I think he had like 13 bites. He was going to short circuit. Like he was going to fucking snap. And uh, it took him about a year or two to kind of deescalate. He, he's cool now. He's, he's still a prick, but he, uh, like dogs lose it. They absolutely lose it, man. So if you don't, if you never, played in that world you're not familiar with it It, it's they operate on a whole nother level man. a whole nother level have you ever had have you ever had one to bite you not like nip but like hold on yeah yeah plenty of times yep okay yeah and they definitely they're definitely different like uh i had my my dog lost her mind completely lost her mind uh we were at a competition and she got a live bite on the decoy's hand you know Mm. dre huh andre carmichael oh yeah 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 all right, so yeah, my dog bit his hand, Oof. and she was on there, and I'm just like, "Good girl, work, yeah, good girl," because I didn't know that <laughs> she had his hand. He was still like, you know, fighting and screaming, 
And so when I finally seen it, it was like blood dripping. And she was on him for a good, a good little second. So she finally, she finally out it. She comes back to me. And so his hand is like crushed. It's like minced meat. And then Ooh. she's just like <sighs> losing it. So I'm like, yes. I'm talking about simple stuff. Heal, heal. She's like, comes in front of me. She wasn't listening. The next exercise, we have a dual attack. So she attacks the first guy. I'm like, Ziva, out here. She's come straight to me. And she's, me and her are fighting for like no kidding. five or six seconds. I'm just like punching her, trying to get her off me. Mm -hmm. And she keeps jumping. And then uh, there's a guy, you know, David Kuhneman? Yes. Yeah. Okay. He jumps over the fence because it's getting crazy right now. He jumps mm. the fence. He does this like military role. It's like, a <laughs> yeah. as soon as he comes out of the role, she jumps because she, she leaves me because I guess mm. she's seen him out of the peripheral and she's just running straight to him. She jumps to like get an inside bite. He grabs her collar and he just holds her there. She fight a little bit. And then when I grabbed her, she acts like nothing was happening. She's like, okay, it's over. Mm -hmm. And I know she saw me. She looked at my face and like, I know you see me. But she was like she was six, elsewhere, man. Like six years old at the time. And I feel like she just completely lost it. Mm -hmm. and, and Imagine then, she's getting that every night. And yeah. Andre, Andre's theatrics are so good in training. You probably it had sounds no real. That, yeah, it sounds real. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you had no way to know he was really getting. Yeah, it sounds really, really, really real. And uh, shucks, Marcus's dog, he had a little pit bull. The dog bit my hand. I don't know if you can see these scars, but my hand, this dog was mm -hmm. on my hand for like a, maybe 30, 40 seconds. That's a long time, man. A long time. And he's yeah. telling the dog to out, and I'm like, oh, and I could just hear like a... Get down here. <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah, don't out him. Just choke him. So he's a small dog. He was like 45 pounds. So I was already choking him. He's turned to purple, mm. and he's just... And when Oof. I see my blood drip, I'm like, man, I'm never going to be able to use my hand right again. But Ouch. it didn't feel as bad as I thought. The pain comes Later. when it when they let you go. When they let yes. you go, like it's like all under your arms, your neck, your your mouth gets real salty. Mm -hmm. Jesus, this, this hurts. But yeah, <laughs> they definitely zone out when they get a live bite. 100%. Imagine that, like, every night. <laughs> yeah, I can't. Fre fre frequently enough, like, they they change, man. And not only that, they become better street dogs, but everything enhances, man. Their drive for toys enhances. Their hunt drive enhances. Like, their detection gets better. It's like it's like human growth, growth hormone for dog training, man. It's like <laughs> hormone replacement therapy for genetics, man. It's incredible how dogs evolve. I try to tell somebody, and this was the argument that I recently had, that I think me taking my dog hog hunting brings something out in him, a different type of fight. Like mm -hmm. to see him go out, grab a pig and, you know, it's squealing and, you know, and then get back to wor working. I just feel like it brings a different, a different edge to him once he's, he's experienced, you know, like getting on something, not killing it, but, you know, trying to. Sure. And some people don't think that that does anything to them. But I try, like, if I have a client, they try to associate two dogs fighting and then a dog biting a human. I, I try to separate the two. Like, I think that it's two totally separate things. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like human aggression, aggression towards animals. But I do connect the two when a dog is, has done bite work before. You know what I'm saying? Yes, 100%. This thing sounds killing me now. No, I, I believe it. It could be, man. It could be for sure assisting the dog, man. And if you've experienced it, who can tell you differently? Yeah, yeah. I guess sometimes you, especially as a dog trainer, you try to analyze every little thing that you see. He's like, oh, why did he do that? Why does he do this? Yep. You know. And then you see it, see him do. Have you ever seen a dog do like something like really, really sketchy, like to where you start questioning his toughness? You know, mm -hmm. like tiptoeing over the water, not wanting to go outside when it's raining, you know, trip out over the like lightning or something, and but still yes. work phenomenal. Yep. Dogs, their, their nerve threshold becomes different when they're out of drive. They're not in work mode. Like the first breeding, malbreeding I ever did was to a dog down in Lauder Hill, Florida, which is one of the one of the dirtiest, violent, violent city. And this dog was named Prince. 
probably the top police dog I've ever seen, even to this point, man. The dog was incredible. So he would he would break bones on the street. This dude would cut his nose and lips, tracking so deeply on pavement and, and asphalt to, to hunt and bite. Like incredible dog. When he was off duty, if he was the handler was walking him down the street and like a tree branch fell off a tree, he would jump in the handler's arms like, oh, save me. Yeah. <laughs> but on the road, a savage man. Thank you, man. Yeah, that's cool. My, my wife just saved me from the sun. <laughs> oh yeah, that's, um, that's good. Uh, but yeah, so they're they're different out of drive. That's perfect, dude. Thank you. Um, um yep, one hundred percent. Uh, uh, we have a, a a good bit of puppies off of uh, you know Ace. Yeah. Off of uh, his dog Jagger. Yep. You worked that? I seen a video. I don't know if it's on YouTube or Facebook, but he was a puppy. Then you were working them. Yep. You were kind of talking to he That dog is phenomenal. Yes. I, I love that dog. And then I love the way he produced. Like the dog, um, Robert Garland's dog, Hero. Uh -huh. he, he's a, a Jagger son. I'm and then, kidding. yeah, and then I have, uh, well, I just sold one of his, another one of his sons. But that whole litter was pretty consistent. I mean, it's pretty rare that you have like eight puppies and like five or six of them working, yes. working good. Yeah, I know Ace is heartbroken, man. He lost them not too long ago and he was young. But yeah. you know the the dog that you worked when I came to Charlie's, the, the big, big Dutch one. Shepherd. That's it, a it's a half brother, same father as Ace's dog. Okay, okay. How the hell you get so big? That thing's huge. I know well, there's got to be press in there or some shit. Who knows? There's no. I don't have. Not you, that you, I you imported him. Well, he's Tony Guzman's dog down for, in Metro Dade Canine Services. Right. So Tony's it's part of Tony's breeding program in Europe. Right. He came. He came over when he was about a year old, and uh, th there's got to be, there's got to be Something. some other shit in there, bro. He's a, he's a mute. Man. Yeah. He's when mute. we went, we went to the UK. Um, I feel like all the dogs that I say sauce. If you hear me say that all the time, I feel like all the dogs are sauced up. Like everybody's panting and they get tired. You can see two, three inches of cheek pink. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, there's something else in there. You know, mountain wise. <laughs> The real Malinois has a like a sleek triangular face, yes. like a, you know, arrowhead. These things coming out like right now I have a my dog's a bull herder. And some of the litter mates don't look mixed at all. You know what I'm saying? They just look like a big head mouth. Oh no kidding. And there's a uh, presser and pit bull in there. So who uh, knows? It's sauce knows all it? in those dogs, you know. <laughs> yes, no doubt, man. No doubt. And you know. It's uh, they're cool as shit to look at, man. But like even that dog, man, like he's a biter, he's okay. But then, I I hadn't done much gunfire with him, I, actually, probably at all. Mm -hmm. And then I saw a little gun issue with him, man, when you worked him that day. And I and when he's out of drive, because the, the country folks by me, bro, are constantly shooting their guns, right. and you could see at, out of drive, you can see him stressed, you know, mm -hmm. which you know pisses him off. Like I, he, you can see him, his grip pull a little bit under gunfire, like. I don't think he's going to quit, but they all got some shit, man. They all, all got of some them. shit. All of them. Yeah. I tell people all the time, you don't know until you know. You know what I'm right. saying? Like, you can never, like, say, it's a lot of people, like, my dog's going to bite. He's going to do this. He's going to tear you up. If this was real life, he would do X, Y, Z. And I'm like, bro, I've had some dogs that I thought was killers, and I seen them. I was like, I'll tell somebody, hey, go in my yard and see blah, blah, blah. I put a hidden sleeve on and just... He's out of drive. He's chilling. He might be laying down in the yard. Just mm -hmm. go run back there. I just want to see what he does. And I've seen some of my dogs. Some dogs I've had just like, you know what I'm saying? Then take off. And then, <laughs> you know, and then I'll, like, I'll get him on a leash. And I'm like, hey, watch him, boy. Him. And he'll go bite him. Yes. So I'm like, and there's a difference between a personal protection dog and a guard dog. Like there's a I think a huge difference. Yeah, pa pack matters, man. That's why I don't do board and train protection because most dogs aren't going to operate at their full genetic potential being having that pack nucleus removed mm -hmm. and coming into, coming into a kennel environment for the first time, they're going to shut down. And let's say they pay for six, eight weeks of training. What are you going to see in that, that period of time? Shit, nothing. Yeah. So, so I, I, yeah. Go ahead. No, nah, so you normally, if I do protection work, it's with a hand, you know, on yeah, a one-on-one so -on -one lesson. So I do it, right? But I do it as like a, a intro to like, so right. you're, you're, I'm going to get his, get him started biting because mo to be honest, most of the time when he goes with a handler, 
they're not handling them right. It's like you can't work the dog how you want to work them. So I bring them out, get them biting, and then he goes home. And then I'll let them handle it from there. And then we'll start working. And it may take a year to get them, a year and a half to get them where they want them to be, you know. And and I think the, the calls have gone up for me for protection dogs. I've seen, like, I get a, several a week, man, people looking for protection dog. And I have a pre-written script in my notes on my phone that I send them. It says basically just that. I said, if they do have it, you're looking at a year of training, about $30,000 worth. You come in three times a week. So it's like I use... MMA is an example. Like people say, I got a German Shepherd. You're gonna be a protection dog. I go, that makes about as much sense if you went to Brazil and adopted a seven-year-old boy, brought him back to America and brought him over to a American top team, dropped him <laughs> off and said, I, I want him to be a black belt. <laughs> what if this dude don't want to get choked the fuck out? And they like yeah, computers right, right, and shit, right? right? Like Yeah, so. I tell I tell people all the time that you can you have to have the proper clay to mold into a pot. Like you can't mm -hmm. just just because you have a shepherd doesn't mean he's going to work. And I, I say that all dogs can be obedient, but all dogs can't do protection work. And that, that small percentage of dogs that can do the work, there's even a smaller percentage of people that can handle that dog. Right. right. So let's say, the dog, yeah, let's say the dog's got it. But to the people, like, you get these folks, man, these, these executive folks that, you know, have planes and nannies and chauffeurs and caretakers and grounds crew, like, and they think Rin Tin Tin's going to pop into action, you know, two years down the road with no training and just know he's the one. Like, it's a, fa it's a fantasy. Yeah, right. It's a fantasy. Some people, a lot of people don't know what they want, man. I just, I just, we just sold a puppy. The puppy left. He was gone for, like, two days. The dude says that he wanted to a more higher strung, like harder dog, more psycho, you know, because right. I was trying to get him something docile. He has kids. Mm -hmm. The first night he called me, he needs to, <laughs> he needs to swap him out. Cause come, come get him. <laughs> he, yeah. He's lighting his kids up and, and it's, it's, it's just not good. So yeah, people, people have this, you know, preconceived notion of what a protection, dog. even when I get pet training calls, I go, what does dog training mean to you? Like, what does mm -hmm. it mean to you? Like, what are your expectations? Like, people say protection, but what does that mean? You talking about scenarios, sending them? Like, what right. do you mean? So there's a lot of gray matter there, for sure. Crazy, crazy. Hey, quick question. Did you, did you retire or did you, did you quit um, law enforcement? I retired in, in good standing. So what that means, I kept my credentials. I qualify for HR 218, which allows me to carry a gun, you know, mm -hmm. wherever a cop does. And which, you know, I left on shitty terms when I was, I, I was suing my agency when I left and I was also getting sued on a shooting. So I had two serious lawsuits, lawsuits going at the same time. So I left on bad terms, but I kept everything in good standing to keep my credentials for that reason. So as far as be, just being an entrepreneur, like what gave you that steam to just say, I'm not going to do this no more. I'm not going to go and apply for another type of job. I'm going to just dog train and this is going to, how I'm going to feed my family. Well, man, for me, my obsession, man, and it's nothing short of that. It's my wife would probably tell you it's a fucking illness for this shit. Like I'm obsessed with this shit. And I've been this way for over 30 years, man. And uh, it, it's by accident. You know, God bless me with this ignition to want to learn about dogs, to know dogs, to want to train them and try to be better and evolve. And, and I was put in a position to learn that. But I loved hunting bad guys, man. Like when I talk about my police career, I loved being able to help people. There's a huge element to that, but I'm not going to bullshit you, man. My, the juice for me was hunting bad guys. Like there was nothing better when the dog's on the ground. We know we're close and we're getting to the bad guy. There was nothing better for me for that. But, you know, I've always trained pet dogs. I always had two jobs, man. So I'd work my 50 plus hours a week as a cop and I'd always have five or six dogs in for board and train all the time. So I've been, I've been doing pet training for like 30 years. Okay. And then I, I was a cop for 17, man. So I, I always knew that I could make a living training dogs. Like that, that was always available to me. But I just loved police work and I loved hunting bad guys. And when that door closed, it was a, just a natural switch. And it, it's just, it's God's work, man. God's, God's plan, his blessing. Like when we moved to Tennessee into a brand new market, like just the doors that opened and the, and the timing was I couldn't have scripted it better, man. It was, you know, and you see it a lot. And what we have in the works for our personal business is that maybe you follow uh, Aaron Taylor and Ridgeside Canine. Mm -hmm. So very similar situation, man. Longtime cop, canine guy, SWAT, military, 
same shit, bro. Like the, like they're, the industry is horrible, man. So cops were leaving in droves. Like Aaron learned pet training and was, had a tremendous business in the DC area where he got to the point. He's like, I don't need to go be a cop anymore. And since then he's developed a tremendous, tremendous powerhouse of a dog training business where he's got locations with Eric Stambro in Ohio, Will Whitting in North Carolina, a, a new facility or a new uh, location out in Northern California. Well, we're becoming a Tennessee location for Ridgeside now. We're very excited. That hasn't launched yet. We're probably a few weeks away from doing that. But um, it, it's because Aaron's got the template, man, as far as the marketing aspect, legal, accounting, you know, it, he's got a well-oiled machine. Like I'm inundated right now with what we do, but I'm a grunt, man. I'm not an admin guy. As far as advertising and all that stuff, man, I wing it and try and get by. But we're super blessed. But we're about to really explode, man. So we're, we're looking for more. You do good, more. though. You do good. We're, we try, man. We try. And, and, but I, I like the team aspect. And there's a lot of different dimensions of Aaron's system that I'm, I'm a big fan of. And also, he's becoming a, a facility to provide the GI Bill, which is going to allow us to become a dog trainer's college for veterans that are getting out in the workforce that want to learn dog training. So that's always a big element to give back to, to military folks. And, and we're also working on a, a, a virtual training plan where we'll be able to put content up into like, a, um, I forget that, that that platform people use for, uh, for training, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue, man. Anyway, we well, can log in and if you want to learn how to do healing or detection or right, e-call yeah, you. you log in, you pay a little fee and that's something that's going to go, you know, global, man. So a yeah, lot of big things in the works, in, man. Put in good educational content in short little bits. Like you can watch this and be like, Oh, okay. That's good. You kind of got to have to have a, be into it though your heart gotta, gotta yes. kind of be into it and you can see okay i want to sit down and watch this and and kind of get the science behind um what you're talking about and that's why i'm excited about what aaron's got going on with the gi bill and the virtual stuff because i really enjoy teaching like my platform is kind of train the trainer and it, it does i have to cater to the pet folks too because i want to train and empower the pet owners too and that's you know our livelihood but you know that that is kind of my platform is is Teaching. I really enjoy teaching. I love the why. I love the science and the psychology behind what we do. And I'm, I'm, I'm just as hungry, man. I'm out there watching and learning. Like I, if I'll go to a conference, like it hits, I'll be fortunate enough to give my lecture in a two hour block. And then the very next class, I'm sitting in the same seat, watching the instructors, stealing what they got to say and try to absorb it, man. So the learning aspect of this is what's kept me at it hungry for 30 years man is that i'm there's no plateau there's it's an infinite learning curve of information and when you think you've arrived you're done yeah like it's I'm always, always it is and I'm always. always chasing it, always chasing it man and that's that's the draw for me so out of all of that all the years of dog training what would you say is a, one of the accomplishments that you're the most proud of in the dog world it's it's crazy bro like i one of my greatest searches is a guy I never, I never saw, like I found him, but I never saw him. So we were getting crushed with a, with a rapist down in South Florida, man. It was actually mm -hmm. an assist to a small city called Palm Springs, which is right in the middle of West Palm, Palm Beach County. This guy was breaking into houses and raping women and children. It was getting, he was getting more and more brutal. And I tracked this dude like five or six times, man. And I would track him like the dog would be buried. And all of a sudden head up, nothing. Like he got into a car or a house. So the last track I had with this dude, he was uh, standing outside a little girl's window, fucking, you know, <laughs> yeah. doing shit to him, doing shit to himself. And he took off running when the mother saw him. But she said he had a white, uh, white tank top over his shoulder when he mm -hmm. ran. So I tracked this fucker, same shit, bro, same neighborhood, like the same area, like same track over and over, like different streets, but like, bro, the same MO. So I'm tracking this fucker going through fucking bushes, jumping fences, you know all the classical signs. It was a, my second dog, Bosco, who was a machine tracking. He comes across, he goes into like a, um, it was like a quadplex, multiple houses, like kind of not apartments, but little quadplexes, four doors together. Mm -hmm. And he's going crazy in the, in the parking lot. He's going up and over this car and he goes onto the hood of this car. And there is the white tank top and a bag of potato chips, right? And he's, he's biting the fucking shirt, like cause he's linking the odor together. So mm -hmm. I called in everybody. I said, fucking knock on all these doors. So long story short, they pulled everybody out. This dude confessed, man. He was a fucking illegal from uh, El Salvador. 
-hmm. he gave a complete confession. He was raped as a kid and he was just getting more and more brutal. And he confessed to everything, all the rapes, all the burglaries and all the shit, all the times I had tracked this dude. And for me, and I, and when I, I told the folks, like I went and took a position behind the house, like in mm -hmm. case anybody ran out when they started doing the knock and talk. Mm -hmm. So I never actually saw this dude. I wasn't part of the confession, the interview. So the dog connected the dots by the shirt. But to solve that, that case and, and, and clear those cases and give those victims closure, to me, man, that was a home run. That was a home run. I mean, I've had, I've had some wild searches. I was, my dog was with me on my shooting. The dude charged me with a knife. I discharged eight rounds. It was dark. I, I dropped him. I don't even know if I hit him. He's flopping around. He dropped the knife. I saw he was separated from the knife. I ended up deploying the dog on the dude. Like some wild shit happened down there, man. But for me, like that one, that one rape case, bro, was pretty heavy, man. Cool, cool, man. Cool. So listen, man, let everybody know what your where they can find you, like Instagram, Facebook, your social media. Well, I'm heavy on Instagram, man, because I'm shadow banned on Facebook, bro. Like I can't I can't move that needle anymore, man. So um but Facebook, man, I got two pages. I got my personal, Justin Rigney, but of course the business, uh, Canine Services on Facebook and, and Instagram as well. So I'm Canine Services Unlimited on Instagram and then I'm JRig Canine on, on, uh, on Instagram as well. Um, once we launch Ridgeside, I'll be having a Ridgeside page as well. So th that's where you can find me, man, lurking on social media, trying to feed that machine <laughs> all the time, man, for business. So. so, man, hopefully in the future, we can link I can get some of this decoy in. If you ever need a, a decoy, just call me, bro. I, I would love to get out there and put some work in for sure. I'd love um, to come down. That's, that's what I'm hoping. So, yeah, it would be great. So we're going to wrap this up, conclude this episode. We've been at it for an hour, and I really appreciate you coming on, man. I'm grateful for the opportunity, man. It was great to chat with you. All right, man. Thanks. God bless, bro. You too, man. Take care.